Well, good morning, everyone. How are we doing? Good. That's the, that's the energy I'm looking for. Uh, good morning and happy Father's Day to you. Yeah, as Aaron said, it is. It is a happy Father's Day. Okay, so I got permission. Um, this is the one day that I get to tell a dad joke, and there's no recourse, okay? None. I, I got permission. Okay. Here's the joke. There's... There's Pop-Tarts, but why aren't there Mom-Tarts? The pastriarchy. (laughs) Shoot. (laughs) Thank you. Let's pray. I think we're all done for here today. Let's pray. Uh, I am. It is a privilege. (laughs) Stupid. (sighs) We we can move past that, right? Okay. Okay. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to turn because it is, like, I, I think, here's the thing. I recognize the, uh, the weight um, as a person who feels like he tries his best every day and also then fails as a dad. I recognize the weight of, of, of that relationship. And I recognize that, that that title or even this day doesn't always bring about positive feelings. And so when we talk about a heavenly father, when we even just talk about a father in general, that sometimes comes with some, some, some weight and some baggage. And so first off, I want to just say I'm glad you're here. Whether you're joining us here in person or online or however you're watching, I'm glad that you're here. And thank you for trusting us in that in recognizing that we want to celebrate dads and father figures because they're worthy of being celebrated, but recognizing that not everybody got that. And even as we were praying with people in first service and just talking to people, there's a heaviness today with that celebration, which I think is true, that you go, man, as, as we experience the high highs, we also have the low lows. And that's why we're a community. And that's why we're together. And that's why we say we're going to do this together and recognize that it's, it's going to be painful for people. But thank you for trusting us with that. So I'm glad that you're here. Uh, secondly, if you are new, uh, first, second, third time, family and friends, we are, we're so glad that you're here. And we actually have a gift for you. If you'd like to join us, we have in our outside in the lobby on the right-hand side, we have what's called our new family and friends. We would love to get a little information from you just to be able to know how to support you and follow up. And then we have this gift. It's our Matthew journal. And we have been for a bit now preaching through the book of Matthew. And this journal, literally, it just kind of week by week, this, page, this week we're on page 157. And um, it just allows you to kind of take notes and to track. I love, when I journal, I look back at what I wrote and I will do one of two things. Either be, see um, where God was moving in that that I didn't see at that point in time. And every once in a while I'll also be like, wow, I didn't know I thought that. That was pretty impressive. Okay, so that was good. Um, but I would really encourage you, uh, I'd love for you to grab one of those. It'd be good. Um, we could probably debate this all day long, uh, but... In literature, um, in literature, who would you consider to be the strongest, most powerful character in all of literature? Movies, stories, comic books, all that. While you're thinking about it, because I'm going to ask a couple of people, uh, j- yeah, be thinking about that because I want to I hear. Who, who would you consider to be the strongest characters in all of literature? Anyone? Give me, shout it out. Superman. Superman. Okay, that, that's definitely one. I would agree with that. Anybody else? Aslan, okay, very Christian of you. Good job, good job. He is, he is safe, but not good. No, it's the other way around, wow. He's good, but not safe, there we go. Okay, Who, any, any others? Jesus. Jesus, okay, absolutely. Braveheart. Braveheart, okay, that's a good one. I came up with a couple of my own. I, I said Superman, um, in, in fictional, I said Superman, I said Thor and Yoda, right? <laughs> Which I'd like to see that battle, that would be kind of fun. So I think, and here's why I asked the question. I think that we are as a society fascinated with people who have these strong powers. We're, we're captivated by that story. And yet we also are able to understand, we, like, we love the fact that when we see somebody with those powers come into a broken world and to solve something, to fix it and to repair it. And, we, and so we get this concept of, of people having significant power, but it always stays in the fictional world. It always stays there. And so if we write these people of even, even allegories of Jesus, like it's this, it's this character that we leave there and then it doesn't ever come and have a, a true impact on our lives. We tend to <clears throat> jump to these ideas of fictional characters and uh, science fiction or, or at best it might even be like a Christian wish or fantasy. But in all them is that we recognize that there is, there's something, it, it doesn't ever become real. 
And today we live in a world where miracles are considered to be either fictional or they're, they're technological because we live in, in the modern age of technology. And so there's miracles every day. I, I use a cell phone. I don't know how that thing works. Like we say we pretend, we're like, oh, it's cell towers. You don't know. You don't know. I don't know. You pick up a small square and your voice carries. There's nothing. There's nothing. We don't understand that. And, and so it's, it's a miracle. We, we, we sit here and we look at these things. We, uh, and so we understand these things. And yet we, I find for myself, I oftentimes lump Jesus in with some of the fictional characters on the page. So then as we are going to dive into, we're going to be looking at Matthew 8, 11 through 17, just, just as, a, as a warning, like don't allow the fantastical nature of the story to become commonplace. Because as you read this, it, we spend our lives hearing these stories and yet this is different. Jesus walked on this earth and lived the life that you and I couldn't and performed these miracles. He changed people's lives. Put yourself into the feet, in the shoes of the people who experienced this, who interacted with Jesus and they, when they met Jesus, their life was changed. It was different forever because they met Jesus. That's not Thor. That's not Yoda. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. And so put yourself there as we learn about these miracles because, and I love this, uh, Tim Keller has a, has a quote that, that I thought was worth uh, mentioning at the start of our time. It says this, if you don't understand Jesus' miracles, then you don't understand him. Because I think that this is more, and it's not that Jesus, the miracle maker, that this is what he did, but if you don't understand the nature and the heart and the character of Jesus through miracles, then we've missed who he is. Because he healed people from different groups. You're going to see a Gentile officer. You're going to see a woman. You're going to see um, unnamed groups of people that he healed. You're going to see all those. And he did it in different ways. In person, from a distance, with a word, with a touch. He did all of those things. That's who Jesus is. But if we go through Matthew 8, 11 through 17, then we see this, that he is healing, but he's doing so much more. He's doing more than that. And so it's easy to look at that and say, he healed somebody and that's it. But there's more to it. In fact, last week, uh, Larry took us from Matthew 1, uh, 8, 1 through 10. And about halfway through, the story continues. And so I just wanted to at least catch you up. We were looking at the story of a centurion guard. And the centurion guard sees Jesus. He comes on him and he says, uh, Jesus, you, I need my, my, he calls him my slave and my servant in different uh, translations. But he says, my servant is ill and I need you to come and heal him. Jesus offers Jesus, he says, I can come to your home and I can heal him there. And he says, that's not necessary. I recognize you as a man of power and of authority. By your word, it can be healed. And that's where we pick up in Matthew 8, 10 through 12. So, so turn with me in your Bibles or it'll be up here and it says this. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their place at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And the servant was healed at that moment. I think you keep in mind before we get specifically into this, miracles do a few things to help us understand Jesus and the order of the world of how we're living and interacting even right now. First off is this, miracles do something to strengthen our faith. But I think miracles are less about Jesus proving who he was and it's more about Jesus showing who he was. And so he was revealing himself and he was showing him and his power. And so it's not only a demonstration of power, but it's, and, and he is healing people, so make no mistake. But miracles are a way to point back to the way that God had established the order and the relationship between him and his people. I mean, think about that. Think about the fact that there was a day, there was a time where mankind, humankind, walked on this earth and, and, and had no sin. That happened. It, you and I can't conceive that. But it's something that actually happened. You see in Genesis 3 where it says that God walked in the garden with Adam in the cool of the day. So there's a sense that there was a perfect relationship that God designed between his creation, man and woman, and himself. And yet it's tough for us to have a full concept of that. And so Jesus performs miracles so that we have an understanding. Now, we, we can think of something like that. We, we know that. We have, we have a before and after. We have, we have B.C. and A.C., before COVID and after COVID, right? <laughs> right, we have that. Do you remember back in February of 2020 when the toilet paper flowed like milk and honey and we just, it was the best, right? You know, it's interesting. I had, um, 
I had a student that was in my youth ministry at the time and he grew up and he graduated. His mom had been battling cancer for five years. And she, this lady was one of the kindest, sweetest people, loved Jesus and just reflected Jesus all the time. She passed away on March 10th, 2020. And I think about for her that on this side of heaven, she has no concept of what it was like. The word pandemic probably never left her mouth. For sure, some of the things that we've gone through in these last two years. And so for us is that we have this concept of that we don't even know what it's like to live a sin-free life. We can't because this world that we're on is broken. And there's a, there's a clock ticking. That there's one day that Jesus will come back, but it's not, it's not today. And so when Jesus would do miracles, it was easy to think that he was suspending the natural order of what was going on, but don't be deceived. He's not suspending the natural order. He's restoring it. He's showing these brief little shadows of what is to come. That we don't know life before sin, but, but he's giving us these, these pictures of what it's like. And it's these beautiful opportunities for us to see and experience that. Because what we see in scripture, so Genesis 1, 2, and 3, he, he creates us that we are image bearers of him, as it says in Genesis 1, 31. And then from there in Genesis 2, it says that he gives us breath. So that you and I, when we take breaths, we are breath carriers of God. We are walking around and experiencing that. And that's what they did. They experienced Jesus together. Or I'm sorry, they experienced God together in life together. And then in Genesis 3, we say no. And we put division between us and God. And then from Genesis 3 all the way to Revelation 21, which is the yet to come, which is the future, which is what we hope in, is where God is reestablishing that, that order and that natural order of the way that he made things and reestablishing that relationship between us and him. And that Jesus comes in the gospels and he comes as a suffering servant, one that will lay down his life, one that will be less than, one that will sacrifice to the point of death. That's what he does. And yet that's not who he will be. Revelation talks about one that will come, that he is no longer a suffering servant, but he's a conquering king. And that conquering king will come and he will make all that is wrong right. So when we get these glimpses, these shadows, these little pictures of what a miracle is, it's a vision of what we have to live and look forward to. Revelation 21, three through five says it like this. It says, I have heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. Interesting that when God makes all things that are wrong right, one of the first things that he does is reestablish relationship. One of the first things he does when he says, I will fix it all is that he says, I am now with you and I will be with you. And not only that, but he repairs and restores not only us, but the earth that he created. Psalm 96 says it like this in verse 11. It says, let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let the sea resound, and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant, jubilant, and everything in them. Let all the trees of the forest sing for joy. Let all creation rejoice before the Lord, for he comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the people in his faithfulness. I believe that if we assume that miracles are that, then we're, or that they're not that, then we're missing the point. That it's not a cute little parlor trick. That he is showing us that which will, and then he's also pointing to what is. In addition to that, I think that if Jesus came only to be a miracle worker, only to do those, those tricks and for us to be fascinated by them, then we're missing the point of that. I would actually say, if that's why Jesus came, he did a pretty bad job. I'd say that he missed a few people because we hear the stories, he did heal people and he did change their life. But, but if you, it, for every person that he healed their life or healed their illness and their sickness, there are probably hundreds, maybe thousands of people that he didn't heal. It's because those are the only stories that we get. I call that Jesus Instagram healing, (laughs) right? Because we're only seeing the good stuff. We're only seeing the good stuff. My wife and I, when we travel, she loves to document our um, our vacations like on on just on Instagram. And so we come back and people go, "That trip, that trip just looked amazing. It did, didn't it?" And I was and I say it was. I had a great trip. But what I didn't document was the fact that I ate three cans of Pringles in the in in the airport because we had a layover. 
Like nobody sees that part of it. They don't see the flat tire. I'm not like, hey, me and the tire, selfie. <laughs> you know, like that. Like that's, I'm not capturing that. I don't take a picture of the hotel clerk who canceled our reservation. Like we miss those parts of it. And so I think for Jesus, we catch these stories and that we assume that this is all that he was doing and yet there's a lot of his life that we never get the chance to see. That doesn't mean this isn't true. It just means it's not everything that we see in this. And so that doesn't mean that he didn't do a bad job, but if Jesus came to be a miracle worker, then he missed a few people. Now, with that in mind, remember that Jesus, when he came as a, as a human, he set his Godship aside. He still had access to it, but he was a human being limited by both time and space. And so for him, if there was going to be, if, if his purpose and intent in those times was to heal everyone, then he probably would have come in a different form. So that's not the purpose of miracles. Does that make sense? Do you understand that? It's not, it's not the purpose. You see, Jesus heals to get their attention, then he draws them into community. He draws them into relationship. We have a physical need, and so we recognize that that's the greatest good and what we want, and yet Jesus sees the decay of this world and the sickness and the pandemic of illness of sin, and he goes, that's what I'm here to, to, to heal. That's what I'm here to correct. That's what I will make, make wrong, or that which is wrong I will make right. And so here's actually, like, if you want to be honest, here's the greatest miracle. That God, seeing fit to be with you and I, took on human form and flesh, lived the life that you and I could not, and that he died for our sins. He took that on. That's the miracle. That's what is hard to comprehend. And we see it in Philippians 2, 5 through 11. Right at the end of 5, it says it like this. Christ Jesus, who, being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. By taking on the very nature of the servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And so then, yeah, amen, amen. And so with that, with that, that's how we approach it as Jesus is interacting with the centurion, with the mother-in-law, and with also the, the demon-possessed people, because you look back in verse 11, and he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. And as he speaks about it, remember that the kingdom of heaven are also referred to as the kingdom of God as this. It's God's people in a place that God created experiencing the presence of God. That's what the kingdom of heaven is. And that is what he is eventually, ultimately reestablishing. That's what we're looking towards. And so then with that, when Jesus is, is displaying his power through miracles, he's even giving you a glimpse of that kingdom of heaven. Often the kingdom of heaven is associated with a feast and that they were sitting with the heroes of faith. And in this case, they were talking about Abraham and his descendants. And so those who believe and, and thought that they belonged, which were the religious elite, he says that they'll be shocked to find out that they don't. In fact, it says that they will go to take their place. You get this picture. It's almost like they kind of walk through the front door and they're like, oh, there's my seat right there. And they're like, that's not for you. Hmm. Interesting. All these people that had belonged to religious organizations that had been the right, uh, had been the right race, had been the right group, had been what they had thought were the right people, and they thought that they belonged, and yet they didn't. Uh, a few years ago, well, a few a long time ago, when I was in college, thanks for catching that. When I was in college, I, um, me and my friends would go and we'd do some vacations. Like we'd just all go and hang out. We'd rent a house and we'd hang out. And so we went down to Southern California and for one of our vacations, we went to a water park. And at this water park, there was a water park and then there was also an amphitheater that had concerts. And at this water park, we were in it and we're hanging out and riding the water slides. And every time we go up to the top, we saw that they were doing sound checks at the amphitheater. We're like, what in the world is going on over there? So we asked around, we found out that after the water park was done and they were closed, they were gonna open up the amphitheater and InSync was gonna be in concert over there. I know, right? InSync, and this is like early InSync. This isn't like bye, bye, bye. It's, it's so, but we're like, oh, that's interesting. So after the water park was done, we threw on our t-shirts and our flip-flops and we decided, I've learned something that's actually very valuable in life. If you pretend you know what you're doing, people will usually give you a lot of stuff. So just take that, that's a freebie. That has nothing to do with this. But me and my buddies, we got into the, his, his car and we drove and we drove to the back lot of where all the tour buses were going in and everything. And we just, the security guard sitting there and he just kept driving. He goes, waving him and say hi. And we're all like, hey, what's going on? He's like, I don't think you should be here. And we just kept going in. 
just kept going in. So we get there and we look and there's all the tour buses. So we decide that we, we go and throw on a lanyard and we just start picking up stuff and moving it around. We're just like carrying boxes over here. We're like, where do you need this stuff? And then we go over here. We ended up saying hi to all the different bands that were there. We sat and had some dinner. We're like, yeah, tour life. Isn't it hard? <laughs> it's really tough. It's just tough. We're having a hard time here. And so then, as they all went out to go do their, their, their concert, we're like, well, time to go to the show. And so we start walking out and they look and they're like, um, you don't belong here. Because our tour, they asked us who our, who our manager was, who our supervisor was, and why you're moving things in flip-flops and a towel. And we're like, oh, got to go. So we didn't belong. Didn't belong. But for this man, this Gentile, though he didn't belong, Jesus said it was because of your faith that you were brought in. Contrast, which is interesting, it's contrasted in light of the kingdom of heaven. Because again, he's talking about this kingdom of heaven and the people who think that they belong and they don't, and he does. And he does why? Because of the color of his skin? No. Does he because of where he came from? No. He belongs because of his faith. There's two times, and, and Pastor Larry talked about it last week, two times they, were, they use the word amazed. In this case, in, in Matthew 8, it talks about that Jesus is amazed by the faith of the centurion. Amazed. The other place that, the, that Jesus was amazed was in Mark 6, 6. And it says this, he was amazed at their lack of faith. Do you know who their lack of faith was? It was the religious elite, the ones who belonged, the ones who think that they deserve to be at that kingdom and at that feast. And those are the ones that Jesus says, there is no place for you. Some of those who think that they're gonna come under judgment, I think is, is, it's an interesting idea. There's a, a preacher from the 1700s and there was a quote that he says this. Jonathan Edwards, he says, almost every natural man that hears of hell flatters himself that he shall escape it as well. But then there are those who belong. There are those who don't think that they deserve it and yet those are the ones that Jesus has because of your faith, you have been brought into this. And so we see this Gentile who is a non-Jew one of the, would be considered one that doesn't belong by heritage, advocate for somebody else. He has power, the soldier. He has authority and he has influence. And so he recognizes that with what he has, he has to do something with it. James 127 says it like this. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. To look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. And though this guy is not a Jew, didn't raise, wasn't raised, his heritage didn't bring him up through the church in that sense, he recognized who Jesus was. He indicated that Jesus was a man of great power and that the soldier had both exercised his power and submitted to power. He said, I, I've got a sphere of influence and I understand that when my word goes that it, it's, it, there's control. You, Jesus, have a much larger sphere of influence. And that sphere of influence goes beyond even what is in time and space, is that by your word you can heal. That's all we need, just think it. Just say it, and he will be healed. That's what he does. And so then the centurion knows, how does he know that he's gonna perform a miracle? Had he ever seen it before? Scripture doesn't indicate that that's true. Everything in this account would indicate that he, he should be far away from the things of Jesus. He was a man of war. Jesus was a man of peace. Jesus was a Jew. He was a non-Jew Gentile. And so yet, the thing again that amazed Jesus was his faith, not where he came from. And for him, it was essentially that he had seen what Jesus, or had heard of what Jesus had done, he, and he had taken the sum of all of who Jesus was, and he put his faith in that. My friends, we have the same opportunity. It's why we run through those doors on a Sunday. It's that we have, over our life, collected up a sum, a sum total of who Jesus is, and that we say that that's the only thing that matters in here. And so we come through those doors, and we sit, and we worship, and we are amazed. That's why we sing together. That's what we're doing. We are declaring amazement in Jesus, but it doesn't stop there. It's that amazement then is to be taken out and shared with other people. That's the responsibility we have. That's the influence we have. That's the privilege that we have is meeting Jesus face to face and saying, my life is different and so I will do something about it. That's what we get to do. Matthew 8, 14 and 15 says, when Jesus came to Peter's house, he saw Peter's mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand and the fever left her and she got up and began to wait on him. So a couple kind of nonlinear thoughts about this passage that I just wanted to share with you. First, Peter must have been a Christian because he healed his mother-in-law. <laughs> you were thinking it. You were. Second dad joke. Anyways, um, but in this, Peter, uh, Peter was like, in all seriousness, Peter loved this woman. She lived with him. And he brought Jesus in to heal her for a non She had a fever. 
How many of you have had a fever before? Like, if you have a fever, you're, you're like, you're probably gonna make it through that. And so he brings her in, he heals her for a non-lethal fever. Do you ever feel like in your own life that you don't wanna trouble God for the, the little prayer requests? Like the little stuff. You're like, I'm gonna take the big stuff, the illnesses or the jobs or the moving, but just the little day-to-day stuff, it's, it's like going to a CEO's office door and you're like, ah, oh, sorry, I don't wanna bother you, but I'd just really like to. And I think I've just, in my life, come to a place of saying, I actually think that God cares about, about the small stuff too. I really do. I really, and, and I think that he wants, even though he knows those things, he wants us to look at him as a God who we will interact with him about even those little things like that. Uh, a few years ago, um, my wife and I, right after we had had our third kid, so we had Jackson, who's our oldest, Isabella, who's our middle, and Charlotte, and Charlotte was like months old. So they were like months, Char- Bella was three, and Jackson was five. They were really into a children's TV show called Yo Gabba Gabba. Anybody else? Okay, so just me, great. Um, I'll describe it to you. So Yo Gabba Gabba, it's kind of like Sesame Street, but it's like if you took Sesame Street and you, you poured like a, a Red Bull on top of it with pixie sticks and a bag of kittens and you like shook it all together and that's what it was. And it was just, it felt like a fever dream actually. Like the, it was these big like life-size puppets and they were interacting with you and it was, it was awesome. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. And my kids, so especially my older two, loved Yo Gabba Gabba. My middle, middle kid, oldest daughter Isabella, had, had, she, she told us that she had a crush on Broby. Broby, you'll, you'll see in a second. She had a t-shirt and it was like, he was this little green character and he was just so cute and she loved him and we loved that she loved him and it was great. So we went and saw like a live Yo Gabba Gabba show. Okay, so we're at this thing and we're like, this is weird, this is super weird. We're dancing, we're having a party and then afterwards, like the show's done. So we take our three kids and we start walking to the car and all of a sudden Belle's like, what? We're not leaving, we're not leaving, it's not done yet. I haven't met Broby, like me and him, we gotta hang out. I'm like, baby, that's not how that works. Like that's, we gotta go. And, and she just, I mean, it was, it, her, her life was ruined. And she started crying and she was sobbing. And she's like, I just, I want to meet Brovi. And I'm sitting there going, I'm going to disappoint her because I have no control over this whatsoever. And I remember sitting there, I was literally sitting in the park, standing in the parking lot. And I looked at her and she's crying and regretting my life choices. And just wondering, I just, in, in my head, I, I, I remember like thinking, does God care that she's sad that she didn't get to meet Brovi? Like it was, and again, it was kind of like an off, offshoot sort of a thing. And all of a sudden, like before I even finished that thought, I had somebody come up behind me and tap me on the shoulder. It was a girl probably about 25 years old. She goes, hey, um, I, sorry to interrupt you. I see your kids. I've got some um, tickets that I can't use for the VIP after party. Would you guys want to go meet the characters? I was like, absolutely we do. Absolutely we do. So we actually have these, these photos right here. So this is at the concert. That's us, that is, and um, that's, that's me without a beard and much less wisdom, much less wisdom is what that is. Um, but there's, Bella's the one on the far left and she's got that little green guy right there. So, so that was that. And then afterwards, this is the VIP party. They are posed with a gentleman uh, who the second photo, this is a guy by the name of Biz Marquis. Does anyone know Biz Marquis? Right, right there. Uh, he was at the party because he's a part of like the whole Yo Gabba Gabba thing. And I was like, here, hold my kid. I, I've never met you before in my life. This makes a ton of sense. So he's like, hey, Bella. <laughs> so that's, uh, that's us with Biz Marquis. And then this final one is, guess what? The kids got to meet Yo Gabba Gabba. And life was good, you know? Absolutely. And it was just... Again, I'm not gonna go and hang my theological hat on on the fact that that if you ask for Yo Gabba Gabba, God's gonna give it to you. But I I will say this. I think that God cares about the small stuff. I think that the things that we think are insignificant are a big deal to God in the same way that as a dad, big things, things that are little to my kids are big to me. And I think that's true. You know, and so we look at this and we see that Peter's mother-in-law was not just kind of healed. She was healed. She was healed. And notice what happens. She was healed and she stood up and she started serving Jesus. Have you ever had a fever? For like a day or two after a fever, you feel like hot seafood garbage. Like it's the worst thing in the world. Like you don't want to get up and do anything for anybody else. And she got up and she was serving other people, not out of obligation, but out of a response to what Jesus had done in her life. Uh, Charles Spurgeon says it like this. The moment the Lord Jesus Christ saves a soul, he gives that soul strength for its appointed service. 
So then I ask us, where in our lives do we take those small little things that we don't think that are that may be insignificant, but to, to acknowledge what Jesus has done and then to proclaim that? Where are we able to live out what God has done in our lives and allow that to echo for eternity because he's changed our lives, big and small. Matthew 8, uh, 8, 18, uh, 16 through 8, 17 says this. When evening came, many who were demon possessed were brought to him and he drove out the spirits with a word and healed all the sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets Isaiah. He took up our infirmities and he bore our diseases. In Matthew, it says on the same day, many. In the, in the Mark account, it says the whole city. Word had gotten out that what Jesus was doing in the life of the centurion. Word had gotten out in what Jesus was doing with Peter's mother-in-law. And now all of a sudden, people were responding, which I think is interesting. There's a quote that C.S. Lewis says, and it says, the pantheist says all things, good and bad, come from God, and that's just how it is. A follower of Christ looks at a broken world and says, that ought not be. For the followers of, uh, of Jesus who were there at that time, they recognized that there was a solution to these people's problems. And so they took them to Jesus. And even in fact, Jesus affirms that he says in John 14, 12, he says, um, I must go so that you must do greater things. And not meaning more powerful, but just it's numerical. It's math. There's more people there. And, because, and so we, as followers of Jesus, have the opportunity to impact because of the fact that there are more of us. And so what can we do? What sort of an impact can we have on this community? Interesting, Larry said last week that miracles are done so that people are brought back into community. So then where in our lives? What people walk through this church and are just by themselves, alone and lonely? What does it look like out in the community? How could we go and bring people in? What would it look for, like for us to be that miracle for somebody else? I spent um, a majority of my ministry career doing youth ministry and so I still every now and again get to go speak. I went to a summer camp this last week down south and spoke, and I brought my middle child, uh, Broby boyfriend, uh, Isabella. <laughs> I, brought, I brought Isabella with me. And like, so we didn't know anyone at camp, and so when she showed up, she was essentially alone. I went to go check in, and I was talking to some of the staff there, and she was sitting at a picnic table over to the side. And before I could even get back to her, three girls from the camp, didn't know them at all, walked up and go, hey, would you wanna come and sit with us? I was like, oh, oh, it actually works. Like this whole idea of, of saying, like, be Jesus to other people. And I saw, and it mattered for her, for a girl who went in probably a little insecure, and I say that because I was too. Like she walked in there and all of a sudden she was loved and cared for. And it was little. Those girls probably never thought anything of it again. But it was that they had an impact. And so for us, we have the opportunity to lower ourselves, humble ourselves, and to look at the needs of what somebody else has and to care for them and to be Jesus for them. We've been given resources. We've been given capacity and we can, in the name of Jesus, solve a lot of things. What if you were somebody's miracle? Think about that. There's somebody tonight that is going to pray for a miracle saying they don't know how their rent is going to be paid and they don't know where their next meal is going to come from. Could we solve that? All of a sudden we become the miracle that they were praying for. Not taking the place of Jesus, but in Jesus' name that we then solve that for people. So then who is it in your life that needs that? As we, as we kind of lay on this thing, I think there's a couple final thoughts that I wanted to give you. First is this, is that healing comes in the form of physical, but Jesus is addressing a, a greater spiritual need. And, and look, I understand if I'm sick, I wanna be healed. I wanna feel better. And I even stand up here today flippantly and say, I'm in, I'm in decent health. I feel like God has cared for me and so I feel like it's almost, I don't wanna come across as flippant and saying, hey, I know this thing that you have struggled with for years of your life, don't worry about that, focus on this. I think Jesus wants to meet you in all of that. And, and though I don't know the timing of what that's going to look like, I do know that as Jesus meets us in our infirmities, as he meets us in, in, in our ailments, as he meets us in, in, in our sin, he addresses all of that together. And I love how the passage ends is that it, it's, it's him fulfilling the Old Testament prophecy in 17. It says this, he took up our infirmities and he bore our diseases. That's the miracle we needed. That's the evidence that's there. Say it like this, he didn't come to bring judgment, he came to bear it. He took all that we had earned. Romans six twenty three says that the wages of sin is death. So what we have earned is death. 
We've earned it because of our sin and our curse and our illness and our disease and all of our brokenness. We have earned death. We've earned that separation between us and God because we said no to him. And yet Jesus took that on. It's all of us. Oh, what a wretch am I? And Jesus says, I'll take that too. I'll take all of it. Jesus' healings cannot be separated from the fact that he forgives us of of sins. It cannot be separated from, from that or that he secures forgiveness through the death, burial, and resurrection. We must remember that as well. He took it all. And so what a different story that we get to tell as we leave here, as we celebrate fathers, as we live in our day-to-day life. What a different story because we're captured by the stories. We recognize the stories of the hero coming and defeating the evil villain. By power, we see him doing that. May we tell a story of God who miraculously came to live with us. He dwelt among us. God with us, Emmanuel, he came and he dwelt among us. And then after he lived among us, he, he would bear our pain and he would heal our illnesses. That's what Jesus did. None of those three groups of people, the servant, the mother-in-law, or the, the, the unnamed group of demon-possessed people, they were all outcasts. None of them were welcome into fellowship. None of them were welcome into being a part of the community. And Jesus came and he fixed that for all of us. Why? Because Jesus was an outcast too. Jesus, a friend to sinners. What a beautiful title. What if we became a community that said that that Northgate, they're they're friends to sinners. Oh no. (laughs) What an amazing, what what an honor it would be. Because what I know is this, is that Jesus came for the Jews and the Gentiles and he came for the sinners and that's us all. Let me pray for us. And we'll spend some time reflecting and responding in light of what Jesus did for us and how we get you through amazement, celebrate here and change lives out there. So Father, we are grateful for you. We're grateful for your your son. We're grateful for his miracles. Recognizing that the life of Jesus is, is about us trusting in that, us putting our faith in him and living different. God, could we? through our time together, through your word, through the life of Jesus, live differently, not only for ourselves, but for those who are in need of a miracle today. In your name we pray, amen.